Hello, everybody. Welcome back inside Wagner Vineyards. I'm your host, Alex Shankowski, joined today by John Poulos. How are you? And I'm sure the first thing on everyone's mind is, Alex, why you dress like that? And no, I do not play saxophone in a ska band. I am here because we're throwing back the clock a little bit for our virtual tasting today. Uh, a couple of housekeeping rules before we dive into that, though. Of course, let us know what you're drinking. Let us know where you're tuning in from, all of that good stuff. We'll shout you out. No matter what your question is, we will ask it. Uh, but a very specific topic tonight, and that is the Titanic and the meals and drinks on the last night of the Titanic, correct? That is correct. Yes. And this is not something that we just pulled out of a hat. This has been a passion of yours for some time now. Uh, 1997. How, do, how does one dive into this um, topic? Well, one dives into it by seeing the Cameron movie in 97 on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, walking into my restaurant, uh, I have lived in the Watkins Glen area for 70 of my then 70 years. Uh, well, it was much less than back then. And I walked into my restaurant um, the next morning at 6.30. We do not, excuse me, at 5.30. We opened at six, but there was always a line of gentlemen at the counter that come in the back door, help themselves to the coffee. And uh, my old friend who's not with us anymore, Nick Ruvalo, was sitting at the end of the counter. And I said, Nick, I saw Titanic last night. It blew me away. He goes, you know, a local woman survived that. Wow. I had no idea. So all day long, I'm thinking about it. Uh, Monday, the next day, I uh, came into the restaurant at 4 a.m., got all my work done, and I was at the Watkins Glen Library at 9 o'clock, and I spent eight hours there. Wow. And I was studying the life of Elizabeth Barrett Rothschild, okay. who was uh, born and raised in Watkins Glen. Uh, the father, she was the uh, fifth child of uh, her father and the first child of his new wife. His first wife died at age 24, and I believe there were 11 children. And they, they were raised in Watkins. The parents died fairly young. She moved to New York in her 20s. She was a, an accomplished seamstress. All the girls were taught by the mother. She got hired by Martin Rothschild of the French Rothschilds. And he, own, he owned a very large clothing factory. Rothschild is a name that in the wine world you see quite a oh, bit. Yes, 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 you do. It's the same family. The wow. same family. And uh, they met. They married, um, she became instantly wealthy, they traveled extensively, they spent winters in France, they came back on Titanic, she lived, well, yeah, Titanic. And, and he died, and they never found his body. So today, I am the world's authority on her life. Um, the, the definitive Titanic book by uh, Charles Haas and John Eaton. Hopefully um, everyone read this book yeah. right in the build-up to so, this discussion. Uh, this is the top Titanic book in the world. They've written five books. They are the experts in the world. And the 100th anniversary of Titanic was in 2012. Mm -hmm. And in 1911, uh, John Eaton, one of the authors, called me. And they do a worldwide magazine called Voyage, okay. and he asked me to write two articles, uh, one on Elizabeth and one on a gentleman named Hull Botsford. I'm considered the world's authority on both of those people. So that's what got me started. Each year at my restaurant for the next 10 years, I did a Titanic dinner. The only book available, you know, if you remember, when, when you're a big time movie now, you might be number one for two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. Titanic was number one for six months. And you couldn't could say it was king of the world. <laughs> yeah. One of the two quotes I know from that movie. The two quotes, yes. Just wait till the second one comes yes, out. Okay. It'll be a blast. So I had a friend. The only book available was a book called Last Dinner on Titanic. Mm -hmm. And it was written by um, a gentleman who was a good friend of Don Ballard, who discovered the boat in 1985, and a Edwardian chef named Dana McCauley. Okay. There were four restaurants on the ship, four. Every other ship sailing made the middle class, excuse me, the, the lower class, the steerage class, bring their own food mm -hmm. for the six to seven day trip. 
they had actually had a kitchen. They had three meals a day served to them. The middle class had a uh, dining room that sat about 535 people. Um, and they, the middle class people that survived said that the food in the middle class, and most people said the food in, in the white star middle class, and we'll get into that in a minute, was better than almost everyone else's first class. Okay. And, and there was no Yelp back then. No. This, this was just kind of word of mouth. And but. there were two, two first class restaurants. Okay. Some at, options when you're out at sea. Yes. Uh, one was that you paid for. Mm -hmm. uh, the tickets for Titanic for the wealthy were between three and $5,000 to come across the ocean. And an they had, and we're, we're going to get into this in a second. We're going to, we're going to get into the type of foods that the first class actually ate and the wine that they drank. Uh, and that's the one that they, uh, every other uh, ship usually used a bugle to tell you when dinner was served, they'd give you a warning in the afternoon. And then you would have to be at your place between seven and like 7.30, maybe eight o'clock uh, to be served. It was one seating mm -hmm. uh, on Titanic because they, the, the Titanic, uh, they had about 350 first class passengers and the room sat over 500. So there was just one seating. And um, the a la carte restaurant or the Ritz restaurant as it was called, was a private room empty and um, this man, uh, Louis, who was a, a chef in, in uh, both England and France, Gotti was his name, he bought the space and decorated it. And it was decorated like nothing else that you can imagine. And if you ate there, you could go when you wanted. You made a reservation. You paid for your meal, though. But mm -hmm. it was extraordinary food, and we're going to talk about that in a couple of minutes. So not too. exactly the all-inclusive cruise ships that you uh, no, uh, know. That you, uh, the, the, <laughs> the first-class dinner was, was pretty amazing. Uh, real quick, um, thank you to everyone who's telling us where they're watching from so far. We've had Massachusetts, Maine, Ontario, Canada, <laughs> uh, people checking in from all over. Let's touch real quick on the wines that we are drinking, and hopefully you're drinking at home as well. We have the sparkling Riesling and the unoaked Chardonnay, both the 2018 vintage from here at Wagner. And we're gonna pair those with a couple different meals. If you uh, followed along on Facebook in the week prior, we posted the recipes for a uh, four course meal. If any of you went ahead and made one or all four of them, all power to you. Uh, post a photo though here in the comments, that'd be great. Be great to see how people are enjoying uh, this talk as you were. Okay, 1907. There were two great shipping lines out of England. The Germans had a shipping line to, uh, they, were, they were good, but the English shipping lines were White Star and Cunard. And in 1907, uh, Cunard launched the Mauritania and the Lusitania, okay. which were the greatest ships of the day. And that put White Star behind the, the eight ball. And they met in, in uh, 1907 when those ships were launched and they knew of them, it wasn't a secret. And they decided to build three ships greater than those two ships, three ships. When I do these talks about Titanic, I normally lead by walking through a room mm -hmm. with a picture. Okay. And I don't say a word. I walk through the tables and the chairs and whatever the people are doing. And I don't say a word. And I get back to where I'm speaking from. And I say, what was that ship? And they all go Titanic. It wasn't. It's Olympic. Oh, starting Olymp them off with a trick question Olymp here. Olympic was launched in June of 1911. It was the exact duplicate of Titanic that was still being built. Hmm. And we're going to get into that in a second. But uh, so Olympic sailed for 10 months before Titanic. They discovered two things about Olympic. The, the first class passengers on the upper deck, it was cold and it was windy and they glassed in Titanic. Olympic had a library that no one used. Mm. And they made so two, don't go on a ship to they read. made they made two staterooms out of it. Making Titanic the exact same ship, a thousand tons heavier, mm. and now the largest ship in the world. I feel like that thousand times that, that weight <laughs> might play a role later on here yes in it history. could so um what happened 
was Titanic was late. Olympic got a gash in it, drew in another ship. And Titanic sailing in April of uh, uh, 1912 was late. Every picture, it's in, and I'll talk about the uh, Jesuit minister in a few minutes. Most every picture you see of Titanic on the inside was Olympic. Titanic was never photographed. Interesting. There were 12 photographs of Titanic, and we'll talk about that. Right now, what I want to do is I want to talk about the first-class restaurant. Yes, please. And the first-class restaurant, and I have to, I, I can't memorize. I memorize a lot of stuff, but I can't memorize all this food. So they had it's a, a lot of, what's what, they seven, had, seven they courses? had 11, 11 courses, 11. 11. Now what Dana McCauley did in last dinner in Titanic is menus from three of the restaurants survived. Okay. And the a la carte restaurants menu did not survive, but people survived that ate there and talked about their last meal. I have daffodils on the table, a first class passenger named Lady Duff Gordon, very wealthy remembered daffodils being on the table the night, the last night of Titanic. She said they looked like they were freshly cut from a garden. That's how fresh they were. So I'm going to slowly go through these 11 courses. They were served family style, meaning the waiters would put the food down in the soup courses, they would give you a choice and they would walk around and you would help yourself. First course was called the, um, the appetizer course of, and I, we posted the menu for the shrimp butter mm -hmm. that you and I now have. Yes. And that was called canopy a la amiral. Also in the first course were oysters a la ruse. Normally a, uh, it was a freshly open oyster with a little tomato sauce on it. And so I think I'm going to have a bite of uh, yes, the shrimp butter means. now. I don't know about you. Uh, uh, I'm, you know, you can only sit and smell shrimp for so long without wanting mm. to take a bite. I made that yesterday. I did pretty good. Okay. And a little of our sparkling Riesling to go with it. Excuse us. I'm sure you have the same thing at home. Now, well, of course, we get the, the lapel mics for this. This so one, and now we're eating right in front of it. What, what Dana did is she paired each of these courses with what she thought would go well with it. And we don't know. We know they had 1,500 bottles of wine on the ship. We know they had 20,000 champagne glasses. We knew they had 20,000 bottles of beer and stout. And we know they had 850 bottles of liquor. So what she's that's a long doing, ship ride, that's a long, no it's, one yeah, six, seven days. Now, if you read about the wine on the ship, what you find is they didn't drink a lot of red wine. And there's a reason for that. When they built Titanic, Titanic had three engines, the largest of any engines ever built in the world. And they were, they, you could always hear the hum. And the farther down you got where the engines were, there was a lot of vibration. Okay. And people talked about the vibration. Um, Titanic was built for luxury. The Cunard lines, Moratoria and Lusitania were built for speed. Mm -hmm. But Titanic was built for luxury. And what happened was a bottle of wine, when it's bottled, goes through something called bottle shock. And if it's sitting in a tank for seven or eight months and you, you rush it through two filters into the bottling machine and into a bottle, the tannins and the components that make up the wine get jumbled up. Mm -hmm. And there's no other, there's no better word for it. And you can't really, it won't taste the same as when it was in the tank. Sometimes it takes two or three months. White wines are usually a little quicker because they, they don't have the tannins, but it's called bottle shock. And on a much smaller scale, that's why when we, ship wine, especially if you're a customer who we're shipping across the country to, will say, you know, you do want to wait a week at least before you drink these wines. And that is, like I said, on a much smaller scale to allow the wine to settle back down and get back to its uh, intended state. So on Titanic, where the wine was stored, near where the engines were, 
the red wine was being shaken. And people that write about it thought it was the sediment that was being separated, but it wasn't. It was bottle shock. Mm -hmm. And so red wine was not terribly popular on, on the White Star ships because it just, it just didn't taste right. So most of the wine consumed was champagne and white wine. And Dana does have some Bordeaux's, but she recommends um, white Bordeaux, which is Sauvignon Blanc, um, or un oak Chardonnay and champagne for this first course. Mm -hmm. We're going to get to some un oak Chardonnay. Uh, the second course was two soups, consomme Olga, a consomme, and a cream of barley soup. So after you got done with your appetizer, the waiters would come to your table. There would be three or four waiters per table, and they would ask you what kind of soup, and if you wanted the other one, you could have both. Third course, served family style, was poached salmon with mousselé sauce, and they recommended a dry Riesling. Fourth course, fourth course was filet mignon lily and chicken Lyonnaise, is that right, Donna Rose? Lyonnaise, she's my teacher. And vegetable marl farsi. She suggested a red Bordeaux with that. Dana did, but mm -hmm. on the ship, we don't think they drank that. So what have we had so far? We've had shrimp and oysters. Mm -hmm. We've had two soups. We've had salmon with a sauce on it. And the filet, the chicken, and the vegetable were served without, without any, just on their own. Mm -hmm. So that's those courses. All right. It's a good start. That, that's and a good how start. How many different wines? About four different wines. There, that's four <laughs> different wines so far. Okay. Now, if you saw the movie, and I know most of you have, every meal, of course, had baked goods, fresh baked goods. And there were 13 on the staff. Okay. Headed by Charles Jorgen who was a, had sailed since he was 11 years old. He had served on the um, Olympic, and he transferred to Titanic. Um, and he asked to transfer mm. to Titanic. He regrets that. When, and so he was a lifelong sailor. He was 34 years old uh, when, when this happened. And he was in his bunk, and his staff was baking biscuits and bread for the next day. And he felt the ship hit the iceberg. A lot mm -hmm. of people did not feel it. They, they, were, they just didn't feel it. Well, you have that much wine yeah, in your yeah. dinner. So I mean. he went upstairs, and he could see the jumbling and some ice, and he knew there was a problem. Mm -hmm. And he went back downstairs and woke up the rest of his staff that were, were sleeping. And by the time that they started loading the lifeboats, mm -hmm. they were bringing them bread. Mm -hmm. He was an alcoholic, and he was sneaking back to his room drinking brandy, and he got quite drunk. Why do I bring this up to you? When I first saw the movie, mm -hmm. at, the, at the end, if you remember, Jack and Rose go down on the back part of the ship mm -hmm. like an elevator. Mm -hmm. Now, up until Ballard found the boat in 1985, he found it in two sections. Many of the passengers in the lifeboats leaving the ship thought it broke in half. Mm -hmm. None of the crew members that were steering these lifeboats and, and, and getting them out of the way remembered that. Mm -hmm. So the official story was the ship just went down. Sure. When he found the boat, when they found it, mm -hmm. then they realized it did break in half. Now, if you look at Jack and Rose at the very back of this of the ship, mm -hmm. going down like an elevator, behind them is a gentleman dressed in white with a flask in his hand. And that was our baker. Wow. And that's where Cameron got the story for them. Mm -hmm. He actually went into the water like that with a life jacket, and he said his head did not go underwater. Mm -hmm. The problem for him was that he was in the water swimming for two and a half hours with his life jacket. Finally, after two and a half hours, he finds a submersible. What there were were three 
lifeboats that weren't the big ones that were on top and, and on top of a roof. And when the ship went in, they loosened themselves, but they never got turned around. And there were many people standing on these or sitting on these and they couldn't take anyone else. So someone from the kitchen recognized him and held his hand for another hour before Carpanthi came. So he was in the water that killed everyone else mm -hmm. for four hours. What kind of brandy was he drinking? Uh, we, do we don't know? know. Brandy is made with fruit, so we don't know. And he lived not only to sail again, he lived till he was 78 years old. And they attributed it to his drinking mm -hmm. and him, him being drunk that the blood did not, whatever the blood does when you're <laughs> in cold water like that. So that's, that's a very interesting story. And I didn't notice the first time I saw the movie, but the second time, there he was. All so right. if you do have the movie, you know, probably what, two and a half, two hours, 45 minutes into it, that's when you got to start paying attention, right, right. remember, or just fast forward for a little bit. That's when you have to pay attention. <laughs> okay. Fifth course. Oh, this is the one. Of 11, with, remind me. Okay. Of 11. This is the one. Now, you've had shrimp and soup and salmon and filet and chicken and, and a vegetable dish. I'm ready for now, more. This is the main course. This is the one served with vegetables and potatoes. The flaming and rice. one, not the main course. Lamb with mint sauce. Mm -hmm. Calvados glazed roast duckling with applesauce. Okay. Roasted sirloin of beef forester with chateau potatoes, minted green peas, cream carrots, boiled rice. Uh, parmiter and boiled potatoes. And that was supposedly served, or she suggested, with a Pinot Noir, which is Burgundy. Whether they did that or not, we don't know. Sixth course okay. was a palate cleanser known as Punch Romain. It had actual liquor in it, and it froze it. Seventh course, roasted squab and wilted cress. That was the seventh course, also with Pinot. Eighth course was your salad course. Asparagus salad with saffron vinaigrette. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Asparagus you need, you need salad. A, you need some, some greens in there. Okay. At some, point. At some place. So you yeah. finally got your greens. Okay. So let me speak for a second. And we talked about the baker, um, about the photographs of Titanic, which didn't exist. Many people remember and reported that some of the paint on Titanic was still wet. Hmm. That's how new it was. It never was christened and it never was photographed. These all sound like bad omens now. Excuse me. On the ship was Francis Brown, who lived in Ireland and was studying to be a Jesuit priest. Okay. And a good, good friend of his bought him a ticket to leave from Southampton, go to Cherbourg, France, and back to Ireland. And that was his ticket. He was a photographer. He, he, he loved taking pictures. And he ended up taking 12 pictures of the inside of Titanic. Those are all that really exist, those 12 pictures. So while he was coming from France to Ireland, he radioed ahead and asked if he could go to America because his friend was on the ship and said, why don't you just come with us and I'll pay the difference. And the bishop said, no, get off the boat. Mm. So he, of course, lived. His photographs became part of history. He became a Jesuit priest. He was a priest in, in World War I. You got to go through with it after and, that. And, and that's right. So, luck, and, sure. and, and so he actually lived through that process and uh, but those are the photographs that exist. And I'm going to tell you a story a little later that's going to uh, that's going to uh, amaze you. Ama wow. uh, it's going to it's going to amaze the story you. So but far keep that in mind is there are 12 pictures of the inside of Titanic. Every other picture you see was of Olympic. By the way, the third ship okay. was going to be larger than the Titanic and Olympic. It was immediately, it was supposed to be called gigantic. Wow. And They're after, the imagination after Titanic sank, they changed the name of the ship because they were building it to the Britannic. Okay. And if you know anything about mm -hmm. Britannic, it became a hospital ship, as did Olympic. Mm -hmm. 
and it got sunk in the, in the Mediterranean. So of those three great ships worth millions and millions of dollars, just Olympic sailed into the 1930s. It all comes down to intention, too. These ships were built only to try and be bigger than others, and yes. you build things with bad intentions, they end up in the bottom of the Remember, beach. the only way to get from England to the United States or from Europe to the United right. States was ships back right. then. And there were really two classes of people in this country, in this world, mm -hmm. and that was the very rich and the very poor. Mm. And the very rich were very rich. And we were living at this time in a period called the Edwardian period. King Edward VII was 59 years old when he became king. He was waiting like they are in England now mm -hmm. for his mother Victoria in the Victorian age you know, to, mm -hmm. to die. And she was, she was, her Victorian age lasted 63 years, but. Must've had a lot of brandy. Uh, a lot of brandy. Um, but uh, Edward, her son mm -hmm. in line was a playboy and he played extravagantly. He was rich. He, uh, he was, he was the one that would allow and bring women into restaurants when most restaurants at the time, the really expensive restaurants and the, and the first, really only catered to men. Mm. When I was in college uh, uh, from 66 to 70, there was a very famous restaurant in Boston called Lockovers. And it was just for men. And it was a world famous restaurant. Mm. After I graduated, then now they're closed, but yeah. uh, they, they allowed women in. So he was a playboy of some sorts. And the period was so extravagant that there was a very, there were two very famous French chefs, August Estafior, and Caesar Ritz. Ritz became not only a chef, but he became a hotel owner. He got mm. backers and opened the Ritz, the Ritz Carlton, the Ritz restaurants. And that's where the, the a la carte restaurant for Titanic came from, was the, the chef there, Gotti, was a, a disciple of Ritz. Mm. And that's, that's, that's where that whole thing. And so the food was very extravagant. Almost all the foods had some sort of liquor or wine in them. Um, and uh, that is uh, the food of that period uh, was, was so rich. Right. And, and we're just talking, we're just halfway through this, you right. know, barely halfway through this menu. That's how they ate every night. Mm -hmm. That's how they ate every night in tuxedos. Um, it was pretty crazy. So let's get back here for a second. John opted not to wear his tuxedo tonight. But that's, uh, yeah. that's all right. We won't hold it again. Yeah, I, I actually thought about it, but uh, I have one for all the years I did it at my restaurant. Um, and I actually thought about it, but I didn't because I didn't know you were going to yeah, dress I, up. So I well, did. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the poor class here. I'm yeah. not, I'm not okay. usually allowed into these types okay. of restaurants. Um, all right. So where am I going now? So now I'm going to go with um, the... Eighth course, now we yes, mentioned the eighth course the ninth, was the asparagus. Yeah. The ninth course was pate de foie gras mm -hmm. with a sweet Riesling, she okay. suggested. Tenth course was the dessert course. Waldorf pudding, which I sent the recipe for. Chocolate painted eclairs with French vanilla ice cream. Why didn't you send the recipe for that one? Yes, um, it was too involved. <laughs> And I did all of these. I, I did all of these. I would not uh, doubt that. Over the 10 yeah. years I did and then the three years at my B&B, &B, um, I rotated all these uh, recipes. So I did all of them. Peaches and chartreuse jelly and French, French vanilla ice cream. And she uh, had a dessert wine with that. And then the 11th course, can you imagine our 11th course, they bring out fruit and cheese and suggested more champagne with that. Here's some more cheese and liquor. Here's, here's wow. some more champagne. So that was that course. Uh, that was the first class dinner. So now, again, remember, not everyone felt the iceberg, and now you start to see why. That was yeah, one meal. Yeah. That was dinner. That was what two, three hours. They probably finished up an hour before the iceberg hit, um, or was still going. Many of them. Many of them were in bed. Okay. Uh, the men retired to a private little club room where they were playing cards and smoking cigars. And the woman had a little room too that they were, they were at and, and most everyone else was in bed. Mm -hmm. And some people heard it. Some people didn't. Some people felt it. Some people didn't. And, um, 
right? We know we know what happened. It, it sunk in a, in a very short amount of time, in, in over two miles of mm -hmm. water. Um, so let me talk about Elizabeth for a second. <clears throat> so Elizabeth, who survived, her husband put her in a lifeboat. Now, you've got two sides to the boat, and of all the years that I've had Titanic, of all the years that I've, I owned a boat, and, and, and now I'm on a boat with a friend of mine, um, you got a left side and a right side. And they got names, right? The, you know, yeah. the, the whatever the what star, they are. What, I okay. So the the passengers that lined up, and many people, these boats were not filled. They were not filled. They could seat fifty five to sixty. They might have had twenty or twenty five on them. Some of them had more. The people that swam up, mm -hmm. but they were none of them were filled. Was this for, just the panic of trying to get them for out? two reasons? Yeah, it was cold. Fair. It was brutally cold outside. Mm -hmm. And the people didn't think the ship was going to sink mm -hmm. when they started loading them. So they stayed downstairs drinking. And when they finally realized that there was water in the in the ship, they came upstairs. And the crew on the, excuse me for not knowing this, mm -hmm. on the left side of the boat. It's Porter Starboard. But, but the, I know that, but I don't yeah, know. 50, what 50 yeah, 50-50 Oh, it's on the starboard side. Um, they were those people only those crew members only let women and children port in. is left port thank you all right the only internet. let only let women and children in. okay that was it on the other side the starboard side if the boat wasn't filled and there was room and then men could get on the boat so that's that's how that's how the men uh, survived there were 200 2222 people on the ship 2,222. There were 324 first class, 285 second class, about 708 third class, 905 crew, mm -hmm. and 705 survived. That means 1,517 people died. And you've heard about there not being enough room on the lifeboats, and that's that's there was not enough lifeboats mm -hmm. for everyone. And they, mm -hmm. of course, changed that after after Titanic sank. But the loading was was it just wasn't organized. Now, when you get on, if you've ever been on a mm -hmm. cruise, before you go to two minutes, that you have a you have a drill of what you're supposed to do, where your boat is, and that's that's been maritime law ever since. So they're out on the water. The the boats are loading, and Elizabeth Barrett Rothschild gets brought to the boat by her husband, put in the lifeboat, and she had a small Pomeranian dog okay. that her husband put in her lap and covered up with his coat. Do we know the name of the dog? We, I don't know no, the name of the dog. I don't. I've never seen the name of the dog, as a matter hmm. of fact. But th that, that's an interesting story that I uncovered. Mm -hmm. Because there were many show dogs on this boat. Sunday was supposed to be a dog show from these world-class show dogs. And that was supposed to be a, sh a show. Mm -hmm. oh, two dogs plus hers, if you want to call her surviving, survived. They, mm -hmm. There were other people. So she had her dog hidden. And it never did it. never made a sound. Because mm -hmm. no one else on her lifeboat knew that she had a dog. Guess what lifeboat she was on? Uh, the Molly, the Mo first lifeboat. The famous Molly Brown lifeboat. Oh, it looks like we have... Uh, oh, we have our, our chicken <laughs> Leonese coming. Thank you, <laughs> Chef. Digital service. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Tally. You're welcome. Enjoy. <laughs> All right. So L-Y-O-N, as I understand now, is Leon in France, was, the, was the, uh, actually the food capital of France. And this is where Escoffier did a lot of his work in creating. And this is a very famous French chicken okay. that I did last night. And then we just we just warmed this up. I'm going to have, we're going to have Chardonnay with this. Excuse us, everyone. For those of you that fixed it. Um, no, I can fill some time here while you take a bite. We actually have a, a question that I'll, I'll read out loud now. And, and you mm -hmm. know, it's just something to keep in your mind. Uh, as we discussed, does not have to be 
something you answer now, but our, our good pal, Michael Lanning, who I know uh, tuned in the last time we were here, uh, just wondering overall your thoughts on like what actually kind of created this disaster. There's obviously a lot of things that went into it, uh, but as you kind of continue to do research more and more, uh, is there any one reason that stands out that maybe isn't talked about as much, or is there just one prevailing thought uh, outside of, of course, the giant block of ice All that right. we ran into? Well, that's that's that's, <laughs> that's, that's what it happened. Did play a role. Yes. That's what happened. But uh, obviously, there's Michael. Much more uh, that good to hear from you again, Michael. Um, if you weren't on watching last time, I taught school for 15 years and. And um, Michael was one of the top 10 students I ever had in my life. A lot life. of your students checking yes. in. So, so, so okay. we'll, we'll put them all on the top. Okay, so we'll later. put them. But Mike, Mike was a great kid. He became a teacher and a principal. Anyway, Michael, the Lusitania and the Mauritania were luxury ships built for speed. Titanic was not. But Titanic, the first two to three days in the water, made such great time that they thought they could, they could show up in New York much earlier than expected. And on the ship was the president of the White Star Line. And you've read this and you've seen it. He ordered, he ordered the captain to speed it up. Mm -hmm. And they hit the icebergs like uh, 1140. And at 10 o'clock, they got a, a call from another ship that had stopped and turned off its engines. There was so much ice. In their, in their vicinity, mm -hmm. and they never heeded that, and um, that's basically what caused this. The the need they thought to get to New York quicker. They could have slowed down. They could have stopped, and they didn't. Mm -hmm. The other issue is when when they find when they found the ship, and and the gashes. Of course, they weren't sure of the gashes. What they think now is that the water was so cold when it hit the iceberg, that the bolts that, that put the plates together popped. Okay. And that was a lot of the problem. Mm -hmm. But from everything I've read, the disaster was, called, uh, was caused not by the crew, but by the head of the White Star Line that wanted to set, not a record, because they, they weren't that fast, but they wanted to show people that they were almost as fast as Lusitania and Mauritania. That's that was the issue. Well, we've all had that time when you're on an airplane and they say you're going to land and it's, yeah. you know, 10 minutes earlier than you were supposed to. And you're all excited. I get that. Uh, however, in a time like this, that's, best to that's eat pretty caution. good. Huh? This is delicious. And it goes it does go really well with, with the, the unoak Chardonnay. Um, you know, unoak Chardonnay for, for those who, you know, might be wary of Chardonnay because you're used to a more traditional, maybe California style, uh, which is, you know, heavily oaked, uh, just very mm -hmm. creamy and buttery, just kind of takes over your whole mouth. And unoaked Chardonnay, uh, it, it still has a roundness to it, but a lot more fruit and it doesn't dominate a meal. And for something like this, uh, with this chicken dish, it's absolutely phenomenal. Most of the world drinks unoaked Chardonnay. Most of the world. Uh, Thanks, Cal. Chardonnay is a burgundy grape and half its DNA is Pinot Noir. Without Pinot Noir, which as I told you in the last time we talked, uh, we mentioned it's one of the three oldest grapes in the world. Mm -hmm. Without Pinot, Chardonnay does not exist. And so Chardonnay is called white burgundy, and that's how they listed it on the ship, is white burgundy. There is a section in Burgundy that does oak Chardonnay, mm -hmm. one little province of Burgundy. And in the 19... 70s, a group of French winemakers, excuse me, California winemakers, went to France and that's where they went. And they brought the idea back with them. Now, the, in Burgundy, it's only partially oaked. It doesn't spend its whole life in oak. And what happened in Southern California is it began sticking in oak barrels for, for its entire time. Yeah. And it created a whole new class of, of, of Chardonnay, uh, really, in the world. But this, yes, this goes excellent with this. All right, so we were talking about Elizabeth in the lifeboat. Yes. Everyone in the Molly Brown boat, if you, if you remember the Molly Brown story, she knew there were only 20-some people in her lifeboat. She could hear the people screaming. She wanted to go back, and the two crewmen would not allow it, and she was screaming at them because she wanted to save other lives. And the two crewmen 
uh, were afraid that if they went back, so many people would want to get on the boat that it would swamp the boat. Mm -hmm. And so they said no. Everyone, everyone on that lifeboat gave testimony, except Elizabeth Barrett Rothschild. She never talked about the ship. Now, when she got back to New Jersey, when she got to Carpathia, the, the rescue boat, mm -hmm. she had a dog. Right. And they weren't going to let the dog out. And she said, I'm not, I'm not coming. And so finally they let her, and she had the dog in one hand. Hate and, landlords like that. And, 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 they, and they towed her up, and the dog made it to New York. And her family was waiting. She actually wired ahead uh, from Carpathia that she was alive. And I, I actually have a copy given to me by her family uh, of, that, um, of that telegraph. And she got to New York and the family was waiting. And the dog jumped out of her hands and got run over by a carriage. Now, because the dog was hidden, when I started doing my Titanic research, uh, in 1997, no one knew that she had a dog with her. And uh, so I uncovered that. Wow. Uh, and that's now everyone knows that she had a dog. Um, she. I'm going to, if we don't know the name of the dog, the no, dog's name is Kulos. I, well, maybe I can I am find naming okay, the dog You're going to name the dog. Okay. Because if you discovered this artifact and the dog didn't last long enough for anyone really to find out its name, uh, I will name the dog Kulos. Well, thank you so much. Kulos. I don't think that's the name of the dog, uh, but thank you so much. Yeah. So, Show me evidence it's not. <laughs> okay, I can, that I can do. So Elizabeth, loving her hometown of Watkins, bought a home in Watkins Glen after the disaster. And she spent summers in Watkins. And she had a seamstress uh, her name was Shanahan, and she would go to the seamstress, um, and remember, she used to sew, and she would spend time there. And she is one of the very few people that she talked to about the ship, and she never really gave any specifics. But the seamstresses had a daughter. Named, her married name was Littell. And I spoke to Marion Littell in 1998. She was in her 90s. And as a little girl, she used to hide under the curtain and listen to the Titanic lady. Mm. And she talked about the dog, a, a, you know, jumping out of her arms. And she had another dog here in Watkins. And the other thing she said that the Mrs. Littell remembered is that she never was able to sleep without a light on the rest of her life. Mm. She had to have a light in her room. Now, what she did in Watkins is she built a mausoleum. And if you're ever in Watkins and you go to the, you go to the cemetery, it was the first Italian marble mausoleum on the East coast of the United States. Wow. And inside of it is, uh, and if, uh, there are pictures of it that I took that are on the, uh, on the internet is an altar and a big plaque dedicated to her husband. whose body was never found. And she is buried inside and her family members are buried inside but she would go there and pray. And she bought a, a, a ton of land for the Catholic Church and the, and the cemetery. And in the St. Mary's of the Lake Church, if you're ever in that church, the first two, and that was my church for a million years, well, not quite, the first two windows, stained glass windows, mm -hmm. you look at them and then you look at the others. They're exactly the same, except some of the glass is not the same color. And she gave money to expand the church. So there were there's one here and one here, and the third one is hers. Okay. And, it's, and it just says Elizabeth, the family, the Barrett family mm -hmm. that she dedicated. So she gave a lot of money to the church. Now, she had a brother that was born and raised in Watkins. He became a priest, a Catholic priest, and he spent most of his life between Buffalo and Watkins as a priest. And she had a home in New Jersey that Martin and her had lived in. Um, and in this home in New Jersey that she spent winters at. Now remember, Martin Rothschild is Jewish. Mm -hmm. And she, of course, is Catholic. And this is how much money she gave to the Catholic Church. When her brother retired 
the Pope allowed the, the Elizabeth to set up a Catholic altar. And he said mass in her home. Despite it being it. Yes. And that was the only altar like it in the United States. And she was given the papal cross. No one had ever received the papal cross without going to Rome to get it. Mm -hmm. She never traveled on a boat again. And, <laughs> Understandable. It, and she was given the papal cross in New Jersey. Um, she, was, uh, she was 54 on the ship. She died in 1943. And she is buried in Watkins Glen. Okay, so, you know, that's, that's part of her story. I mean, there's other mm -hmm. parts of her story. There's a very famous poet named Dorothy Parker. And Dorothy Parker is the daughter of Martin's brother. Okay. And she took care of her. Dorothy had a, a real drinking problem. And if you want to look Dorothy up, she, she's very famous. And uh, uh, Elizabeth used to take care of her. She'd take her to San Diego uh, to the Hotel Coronado and dry her out. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, you know, that's basically Elizabeth. Um, she uh, lived the rest of her life dressing in black. Um, my mother is just, my mother was born in 22 and she would walk the streets of Watkins and Elizabeth would walk the streets of Watkins with her little dog and the girls would go, you know, 10, 11, 12. Mm. That's the lady from Titanic. Wow. So my, my mother actually mm. remembers seeing her. Okay. All right. Uh, a yeah, no. couple, couple quick notes here, just from some commenters, um, GB Amanda talking about how pairing the 2012 Meritage with Ses uh, seared sesame encrusted ahi tuna. And it was amazing. That sounds mm -hmm. absolutely incredible. Uh, they should have had that on the Titanic. And <laughs> yeah. then uh, Donna bringing, out, uh, bringing up that alcohol does not prevent hypothermia, just in case anyone out there is thinking about uh, thinking <laughs> now that they can uh, mimic the, the story of this uh, baker. Uh, yes, do not try that at home. Folks. Yes. Um, thank you. They thank had you. no other reason, though, to, why he survived and, and didn't, uh, <laughs> than other than the alcohol. Uh, well, uh, thank so. you to Donna for, for setting the record <laughs> thank, straight. Thank there. you, yeah, Donna you, Rose. You hear it on the internet and then everyone believes yeah. it. Uh, it's, it is good to say that. Okay. So, but what, what you read about him, that's, that's what they say. <laughs> I've read that, too. Yeah. I've read that, yeah. too. Um, all right. Let me tell you. Tom Brewer wants you to know. Tom Brewer's, you know where Tom Brewer's from? Did he tell you? Tell him where you're from, where, where you're calling in from. Uh, there's a delay. He'll, he'll okay. Yeah. All right. Oregon. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Oregon. Excellent. All right. Um. So I researched this this ship for about thirteen or fourteen years. It would I would take half my half my time every every year that we did a Titanic dinner at the restaurant, always on April fourteenth. I would spend four or five months researching and making a menu, uh, an eight and a half by 14 menu, information on both sides, and featuring, featuring a passenger that was fairly local. My daughter was born, and I think she's watching. Hello, Hobie girl. Uh, was born in 1992. I started at the restaurant in 1985, and I would work from 5.30 in the morning through the lunch hour at one and go back at five or five thirty until eight, nine, ten o'clock at night, uh, six days a week. And Wednesdays, I just worked half a day. I was always there lunch hour until 1992 when Hobie was born. So when my daughter was born, my father said, son, why don't you go home and feed your daughter some lunch? Fair. So I started doing that. And dad said, I'll take a dad said, I'll take care of the lunch hour. Don't worry about it. So I started in uh, April of uh, 1992, going home at 11, 30, 12 o'clock. And I did that for the rest of my time at the restaurant. So now we're into the third or fourth year of my Titanic mm -hmm. experience at the restaurant. I used to decorate the restaurant one month ahead of time. So I had collected pictures like this, mm -hmm. Um, newspapers, not authentic newspapers, but replicas that had who lived and who died in the ship. And I had them all framed and I had them hung and all, the, all over the restaurant. So we're into probably 
1998, 1998, I hope he's like seven or eight years old. And she got out of school early and I picked her up. And on the way home, she goes, Daddy, I'd like a cheeseburger. So we stopped at the restaurant and sat at the counter. And my father said to me, son, go talk to those two troopers in the second booth. So there were two female troopers in the second booth. And I went over and I said, what can I do for you? And one of the troopers said, what's all this Titanic stuff? And I explained to her, you know, about Elizabeth and, and, and I did this dinner every year. And she smiles and she points at the New York Times and so goes, that was my grandmother. So then I sat down with her and she started telling me her story. And it became the subject of my next year's passenger. And her name was Mary Carmichael Graham Farkerson Martin. Wow. That is uh, she was, her mother was, uh, she was born in Ireland. They came to America. Well, her mother came to America. She was born here. And her mother opened a very, very, very famous clothing store, a very, very high-end clothing. and became quite famous in New York City. Macy's. She, it, <laughs> no. So she married at age 19, a protege of Kodak, oh. of George Eastman, who had moved to New York City and started a motion picture company. Theirs was the first wedding ever filmed. They went to Europe to honeymoon, came back on Titanic, 19 years old. He died, she lived. She remarried and moved to the Adirondacks, the very wealthy gentleman in the Adirondacks. And they had children, and then the children's children had the trooper. Mm -hmm. Remember, I'm never in the restaurant at one o'clock in the afternoon, never. Mm -hmm. I happened to be there that day. They could have sat anywhere. That was the only newspaper there with her grandmother's name on it. Mm -hmm. They could have sat anywhere and this conversation wouldn't have happened. This conversation shouldn't have happened, mm -hmm. but it did. So she told me about her brother, Stuart, who I've met and talked to and, and, and he's been here. And so she put me in touch with Stuart and we met in Syracuse. Stuart was in... Uh, he has a B&B &B in the Adirondacks. And Stuart told me this story. And, and, and she had started the story for me. She said, let me have Stuart. So Mary Marvin, and she married, she got remarried and the name was DeCamp. But Mary Marvin was just like Elizabeth Barrett Rothschild. She never spoke about the, never spoke about it, mm -hmm. never said a word about it. Um, they found in her in her drawer when she died all these invitations for annual. There, there for years they had survivors mm -hmm. met and and, mm -hmm. and 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 talked about it, and mm -hmm. and it was like a club. She never even opened it, wow. so she never talked about it. And the grandson Stuart kept talking. Please, Grandma, tell me about Titanic. Tell me about Titanic, and she never would. Mm -hmm. So in her 80s, one day, Stuart's nine years old, and they lived on the Moose River, and the Moose River was calm. And she said, take me out on the rowboat on the Moose River, and I'm going to tell you about Titanic. So they're out, on the Moose, they're out on the Moose River talking about Titanic. And she had, if you remember now, you young people don't remember this, but there used to be 16 millimeter films in these big cases like this. Mm -hmm. and, and you'd have to run them through a projector to, to show a movie. And she pulled one out of a satchel. Remember, her husband, Daniel's father, was in the motion picture business. Mm -hmm. And she took this out and she held it to her grandson and said, this is the picture of our wedding. And she threw it in the Moose River. Wow. Then she pulled out another one. Now, remember, in the beginning of this conversation, 
No pictures exist of the inside of Titanic except the 12 taken mm -hmm. by the Jesuit priest, which are still, still used pictures. are still yeah. used today. And she goes, Daniel took moving pictures of the inside of the oh. Titanic. And she threw that into the Moose River. No one knew this. No one knew this. Stuart if I, had, got if them I hadn't been to the diner and if they hadn't sat there, the story, he didn't think it was important. He didn't know the, he didn't, he, didn't, no. he had no idea that the ship had never been photographed. And she had sat on this all these years and threw it in the Moose River. And she was dead two weeks later. Wow. That's, <laughs> that's, a... that's one of my, Many, many stories. James Cameron, if you're watching, sorry, someone <laughs> beat you to it. So, uh, yeah, that is, that's, that's incredible. Today I heard from Jane Napier. Okay. Okay. I graduated from Hobart College. Can I get to one question? Yes, go ahead. Sure. Do that? Sorry. Uh, another former student out in San Francisco, Jeff Teeter. Oh, Jeff. Uh, it's a great talk, he says. But just wondering real quick, are the articles that you wrote for Voyage available online or could you post them on Facebook or something um, down the road? I don't think, uh, Jeff, what I'll do is I will look for them. Okay. Okay. Um, if, if you find them, I can. This, this, I can yes. Or we could maybe make copies of them yeah, or something. Yeah, I, I can handle and that. And get if, them to you. If you have you. copies of them, yes. I can, uh, I can that, handle This them. is the Elizabeth one. And then the other one is Hull Botsford, who we haven't talked about yet. And that's another incredible That's story. for hour number two. If we'll we, pour a little we, more we're, wine. We're almost running. Oh, it's dessert time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so enthralled by the story. I didn't realize. I thought it was about 20 after five. <laughs> it's, we're, it's, First time in my life I've forgotten about dessert. Okay, so... This is a Waldorf pudding that I made yesterday with apples and, and golden raisins. And uh, this goes really well with the um, sparkling Riesling. But on the bottom here, we've got a little pudding that I made. Oh, that's pretty good, too. That's delicious. That's pretty good, too. We're back from champagne. Um, Reminder, everyone, if you are hearing us smacking our lips <laughs> and are curious. We, to we have new microphones. Own, we do have new microphones, so I hope it's crystal clear our smacking. But also, go on the Facebook event for this discussion. There you will get see a link to a Google Drive where you can download four recipes, three of which we've eaten here. So you've heard us eat them. Uh, make them yourself. I highly recommend it. Get some Wagner wine as well to pair with yeah, it. Yeah, Wagner wines, yes. Has uh, to be Wagner. That's what they drink on the tank. So I'm a Hobart graduate, 1970. I think I mentioned last time I actually went to school with Bill Whitaker, 60 Minutes, and a few other, if you saw the, uh, the royal wedding, mm -hmm. um, the uh, Episcopal bishop from the United States, Michael Curry, that spoke at the wedding, is also a Hobart grad. And we were both elected to the board of trustees together in 1988. Wow. And we became fast friends. And Michael used to read his sermons to me before he went back to Baltimore to preach. And uh, I said, that's not bad, Michael. And that's, uh, he became the uh, head of the, the Episcopal Church in this country because of the way he spoke and taught and a uh, great guy. And there's, there's other Hobart. So anyway, I'm on the board of trustees at Hobart during this Titanic period and never really talked about it because we were so busy. I, I never brought it up. Uh, eventually, it, it uh, came out in the magazine ap after this incident that happened. So... Every year, after I'm done and do the three or four months or five months research, I opened up the Bible of Titanic here from Eaton and Haas, and with all the passengers that were listed, uh, survivors and those that died, and I would try to find someone local. And we're not going to get to Hull Botsford from Millport that uh, built every railroad station between here and New Jersey, uh, and he died on the ship. Uh, uh, national champion wrestler at Cornell, uh, a genius. And um, um, I met his sister Talitha in her 90s wow. and spent a lot of time with her. And his, the last effects that she had of his, Cornell has all the rest. They still teach his methods now at Cornell. For and, wrestling? And, no, for the, oh. for the architecture. I'd say they've had An a architecture. lot of, they have a good wrestling. Archi programs. Yes, they do. So I'm looking at this uh, next year. And I see the name Charlie Fox, Rochester. 
There was a couple from Ithaca that survived. We're not going to get to them today. There was a lady from Watkins. There was Hull Botsford from Millport. There was a lady from Geneva that survived. Um, and now I'm into Rochester. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just quickly reading over what I can find about Charlie Fox to, to, to get myself set for the next five or six months when I start doing this again. And I see the name Napier underneath it uh, as, a, as a source. Well, I sit on the board of trustees with a Jane Napier who actually got a hold of me today because I forgot the name of her grandfather. <laughs> but uh, so I called Jane and, and she lives in Rochester and I think she was in Florida. She may have been in Egypt. I, I forgot to ask her today, but she called me and I talked to a couple of people and she said, no, she's in her winter home. And then I think she was vacationing and she called me mm -hmm. and she, I said, Jane, you, you know, this could have waited. She says, no, what did you want? And I said, have you ever heard of Charlie Fox? Excuse me, Stanley Fox. Ah. And she goes, he's my grandfather. He died on the ship. He was, uh, he was he was in Europe doing work for his company in Rochester. They found his body. Today on my Facebook page, I posted about the McKay Bennett that, that went the 800 miles where Titanic sank and spent well over a week. One year ago today is when they returned with the bodies. Wow. If you were a crew member or if you were steerage or third class, and they can tell how they were dressed. Mm-hmm. They put steel rods inside of you in, in your clothes and threw you in. You were buried at sea wow. and they couldn't identify them. And they brought back 190 bodies. Some of them were never identified and they were buried in, in Halifax. And the ones that were identified were sent back to the States. And Stanley Fox was one of them that was identified. And his story is pretty remarkable. Um, on the way, uh, I guess he married someone, uh, and, and Jane, I'm sorry if I don't remember the story. I should have read it, uh, reread it again. It's been a long time. But he married someone from the other side of the tracks, I think it was called, in Rochester. And they, the family didn't want him buried in that cemetery. So the family knew some people, and they got the prime minister of Canada to stop the train. And they took his body off and brought it home another way. And so when his body got back to Rochester, it wasn't on. So his wife couldn't get the body. But again, here is I'm sitting with Jane all these years doing Titanic, never knowing that her grandfather was on the ship. Wow. So, you know, that was that again was pretty amazing. And uh, well, we are past an hour. I know. I know we've got enough uh, we got drinks enough, and food I, I and stories. Enough. We could go until Six late tonight. I'm yes. sure. Uh, Any other questions we yeah, could answer? Uh, there, there's no questions outstanding right now to my belief. If you had one and I didn't answer it, just throw it in again. Um, but, you know, either way, uh, get those in. One question is just what do we have planned for next week? Uh, I will be back out in the vineyard with the other John, John Wagner. Uh, we'll be in a special vineyard, though. We'll be in the Kaywood East Vineyard talking a little bit about uh, all that goes into that block, 15 acres of Riesling that we make into our single vineyard Riesling. Uh, our 2018 Kaywood East recently scored 92 points in Wine Enthusiast, so there's a lot to talk about there, uh, partly why we got these new microphones. If you watched the last time we were out in the vineyard, it was quite an experience just <laughs> using a cell phone. Hopefully it's not snowing uh, next week, uh, but also we will have a little bit better equipment, so hopefully you'll be able to hear better uh, and get those questions in. Um, Steve Lee says hi. Hi to Steve. I haven't seen Steve in a long time. Yeah, it's been a while. Uh, let's see here. Just uh, Lorraine Giordano Sortino says that she's here. Wanted to let you know she's here. Listen to these um, amazing stories. That's, uh, uh, her son is my is my daughter's boyfriend. Oh, okay. Very, very bad. Missed them in Easter this year because <laughs> they didn't want me to get near them. I thought I might get sick. Oh, fair, fair. Uh, Rebecca, br bringing up about Dorothy Parker. Um, more, uh, it says Dorothy Parker wrote more, much more than just poems, was yeah. driven to alcoholism by being an intellectual in an anti-intellectual world. 
definitely. Okay. I, I understand how that can feel sometimes. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm not on that level. Uh, brings up her short story, though, Big Blonde, and says that that okay. matches that, too. A um, couple more thank yous, letting us know uh, that they enjoyed the talk. Uh, we enjoyed putting on this talk. John, when we John brought up the idea, he would have been ready to go at that moment. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of second nature to him. Uh, for me, I get to just sit here, eat food, and drink wine, uh, which I'm always ready for and eager to do. So if you enjoyed this talk, as you know, there we could do a part two at some point. Uh, we're hoping we'll get good news in a couple weeks in terms of when we'll be able to actually open back up here. Uh, but even if that is the case, uh, you know, we have every intention of continuing these series in some degree uh, because we so thoroughly enjoy doing them. It seems like those, you know, that you guys enjoy them as well. Yeah, uh, and so. We want to thank everyone for continuing to drink Wagner wine. Exactly. Our, we have a staff back there that spends all day yes. sending out cases. And, and I think the FedEx people hate us because they've actually had to put on an extra truck. So we thank all of you for ordering our wines and, and keep it up. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to, you know, we're making it now. And, and we've uh, got a lot still. <laughs> yeah, There's plenty got, to get a lot of wine. Uh, it, on that, on that note, uh, the 2018 dry Riesling has been released it's, it's, and uh, I got to taste it the other day for the first time. Uh, and it is delicious. It's a great follow-up, great encore performance from the 2017, which was such a flagship wine for us. Uh, and you know we we were able to 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 get that far and wide, and a lot of people got to drink it. We're really excited to see what you guys think of the 2018. Uh, I think it's going to be a great summer wine. It, I, haven't, uh, I haven't had it yet. I know um, I bought the last few bottles of the uh, <laughs> of the, the 17. 17. The 17 uh, will go down in Wagner history as one of the great wines. You know, it was the uh, it was the uh, named uh, by the New York State Wine and Grape Foundation, and you know how many wineries are in this region but it was named best dry Riesling, best overall Riesling, best white wine in the state of New York. Uh, wine enthusiast named it the 64 best buy wine in the world. Yes. And they only look at 18 or 19,000 bottles of wine a year. We haven't and, even brought up Oprah. No, and Oprah, Oprah who, who listed 25 wines to drink at Thanksgiving, there was only one American wine on the list and it was our dry Riesling. So when you drink, when you drink Wagner wine, that's why I said last time. That's why I drive an hour to work every day because yeah. uh, there's no place in you can, between. You can tell life. John misses being able to talk yeah, to you guys. I do. Every come on day. in, <laughs> come on in, and let me talk to you, please. Um, we We're going to do a virtual tasting tomorrow, right? Took, yep, exactly. We're Where we're, are they from? Um, I don't. It's a couple. One is like in Massachusetts, and the other's Indiana, <laughs> and they can't get together. So what they've asked is, uh, we're going to do a virtual. Uh, excuse me, something called Zoom. Yes, okay. it's called the Zoom. I'm yeah. 72 years yeah. old. I, I just got a I just got an iPhone about a year ago. <laughs> so, so there's something called Zoom. Yes, and uh, I'm going to talk a couple. Yeah. located at two different mm -hmm. places through Bordeaux Reds tomorrow. Yes. Okay. So. And for all those who want to be a part of that as well, we are putting together a package so that that can become a thing for everybody. If you are interested in that at the moment, though. Uh, go on to the Wagner website and fill out a contact us form. Go to the contact us section, fill out a form, let us know you're interested, and we can set something up for you. We're working to put something together uh, that's going to be more forward facing so you know about it. Uh, but we're, we're testing it out. And, you know, and like I said with this tasting, you know, even when we are able to welcome people back in, you're still going to have that where people right. are in, you know, different parts of the country. We want to be able to help be, be a part of that discussion. So uh, be on the lookout for that. Uh, be on the lookout for the 2018 dry Riesling. We might even do a tasting of that because um, aromatically it is just phenomenal. Uh, a really good acidity as well. Like I said, it's going to be a great summer wine. Uh, and that's going to do it for this one. Uh, if you remember from the last time Mr. Pula was, was a part of this, he goes back in and reads all the comments and answers them. So if you're watching this after it's live, that's okay. Get your questions in, get your comments I'll in. I'll go back and, and do the best I can to answer your questions. Exactly. And, uh, if you need to know information, I, I can give you my email address and, uh, and we can talk Titanic because I can talk Titanic forever. Yes. So. Longer than even the movie itself. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I guess I could. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank well, you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to get up and end the stream. So any last words? By no, but I just uh, thank everyone from, uh, you know, from viewing. And uh, like you said, maybe we can do a part two sometime. Yes, we can.